So hi, uh, my name is Julia McKenzie and I work for Anglia Ruskin University. Um, I'm going to talk today about research conducted in Cambridge University Botanic Garden, specifically research on blue tits and great tits and their trials and tribulations in raising a brood in a large urban habitat. This research has been done in collaboration with Nancy Harrison, also from Anglia Ruskin University, and Shelley Hinsley from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. This slide offers a little introduction on uh, what this presentation is about. Um, I'm a researcher and I've been studying blue tits and great tits in the Botanic Garden since 2004. Uh, so that's more than 17 years. Uh, originally this was done alongside my colleague Dr Nancy Harrison, but since her retirement in 2013 I've taken over the Nest Box project. Um, in your excursions to the garden you may have seen several nest boxes scattered around. We collect data from the birds nesting in these boxes and I'll discuss more about that later. Um, in this presentation I will talk about the different types of habitat you find blue tits and great tits in and how these habitats can affect their breeding success and the chances of their offspring surviving. We now have a long term data set which has allowed us to compare how well the birds breed in the different habitat types. I will talk about the results we have and discuss our findings what our findings mean for birds living in urban environments. So first off, I will introduce the two species of birds that I'm so familiar with and that I'm sure for many of you who have bird feeders up in your gardens would also be familiar with. However, it doesn't hurt to run through some of the, the, the facts about them. Um, the blue tip shown in the first picture is a medium sized bird um, it weighing around 11 grams. It's a feisty little bird with a distinctive bright blue head, uh, wings and tail, has a black eye stripe and a yellow belly. It can often be seen in the spring flitting about in pairs, calling to each other whilst foraging in the tree canopy for insects. It commonly hangs from trees, unlike the great tit, who, um, being more heavy and being less able to flex their legs, is better suited to standing in trees. The great tit in the picture um, on the right is the UK's largest tit. It is green and a yellow bird with a striking glossy black head. It has white cheeks. In the spring it has a distinctive two syllable song um, that could be heard from the male defending his territory. It kind of goes teacher, teacher, teacher. Males and females can be told apart by looking at the black belly stripe. Males have a thick belly stripe compared to the thin, often broken looking and drab female belly stripe. The great tit can be quite an aggressive bird at the bird table, fighting off the smaller tits. And in winter, it joins with blue tits and others to form these roaming flocks which scour gardens and countryside for food. Both species eat a diet of insects, uh, seeds and nuts, and both nest in holes, and they readily take to human-made nest boxes. So I'm just going to show you a couple of videos of the birds, so you can see. Um, so in this first footage, you can see a blue tip collecting nest material and, uh, and then she goes off to feed the nestlings. Um, the bird in the footage is quite drab in colour, so it's most likely a female. And the males are usually much brighter in comparison, although you can't really tell for definite. And in this video, we have one of the great tit. Um, in this footage, uh, you can see a male with a large caterpillar in his mouth. You can tell that he was a male because he had a, a big belly stripe. Um, and here we have the female. Um, she has a much thinner belly stripe, you can see. She's here just collecting nest material from a tennis ball. Um, So I'm just going to talk a bit about um, blue tit and great tit habitat. Um, both species were originally described as your typical woodland species, but they're now often found um, and described as garden birds due to them being found around human habitation. 
So they're often found in human habitation because the decline of woodland, um, which now only covers about 13% of the UK land surface, and also because of rapid urbanisation in the UK. That's also happening worldwide too. And this has meant a loss of the habitat that is likely to be the best for them. Uh, as I mentioned previously, blue tits and great tits nest in holes, and so they readily take to human-made nest boxes. And they're now found in lots of habitats other than woodland, including parks and urban areas, and it's, it's actually great to see them taking up the nest boxes in your gardens. Whether urban habitat, though, is suitable for them is debatable. Um, I've added to this slide some extreme examples of where birds have actually been found nesting. So in the first picture you see uh, is a great tit taking out a faecal sac from a water pump. Um, just as an aside, a, a faecal sac is like a membrane that surrounds the, the poo of a nestling and it allows the parent birds to, to take it out of the nest and take it far away to keep the, the nest clean. Um, and it, in the second picture you see a blue tit and it's about to enter the nest it's made inside a cigarette bin. Now these were, I think, originally published on the on the Springwatch site a few years ago, and it was a kind of a, like a jovial piece. But they do actually highlight how habitat loss is affecting nest site choice, and in particular the loss of woodland in the UK. These birds would not ordinarily choose to nest in these kind of places, but due to the loss of natural nest sites, they're increasingly being forced into human altered habitats. So nest site selection can have direct effects on the survival of their nestlings, and I'll discuss this a bit later. So as I mentioned, um, woodland is really the optimal habitat for blue tits and great tits. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about the loss of woodland in the UK. Um, the latest Woodland Trust report, which was out actually earlier this year, says that there's been some improvements with regards to woodland in, in the UK. So it's up from 12% to 13.2% land cover in the UK. However, much of this increase has been due to the increase of plantations. And these plantations often have uh, low tree species diversity. So a low number of um, species of trees within them. And uh, low tree species diversity has been found to correlate with low animal biodiversity. So biodiversity is, is the variety of species, so how many different species you get in, in one habitat. The report has also found that the woodland that is present is often isolated and fragmented and is in poor condition. So just 7% of woodlands are in good condition. Uh, there are very few examples now of woodland with veteran trees and many woodlands lack open habitats due to their overall reduced sizes. There's insufficient diversity in ages of trees, so you have mostly young trees making up the majority of woodland. And the biggest reason for the loss of our woodlands is due to humans changing the landscape, uh, be it through urbanisation or farming. Um, I think those are the main reasons. So alongside humans uh, changing the landscape, species biodiversity has been in decline. Uh, this figure that you see in the slide was taken from a report in 2004 uh, by the IUCN and shows that habitat loss and degradation is a major cause of bird extinction throughout the world. Um, so this is a direct consequence of increased human activity and links to the loss of woodland habitat in the UK. The paper that I've mentioned on the bottom of this slide uh, by Sia and colleagues, um, although it's over 20 years old now, it's still very relevant today and is still cited by many scientists. They reviewed the results of a conference held in Helsinki about habitat loss. They discussed the different approaches to studying habitat loss, for example, genetic and ecological approaches, and how severe habitat loss and could become and also its impact on biodiversity. They also reviewed ways to prevent its effects. So Sia and colleagues uh, reported in the paper mentioned 
um, that habitat loss involves at least four phenomena and those are reduction in habitat area, uh, habitat fragmentation, habitat deterioration within patches and deterioration of the habitat matrix between patches. So I have an example image here of a typical UK landscape uh, with areas of woodland surrounded by farmland. Um, Taken Sia and his colleagues example of these four phenomena, I'm going to apply them to this image. So the first phenomena is reduction in habitat area and in the image this would be shown by the reduced sizes of the woodland patches compared to the larger woodland patch. So you've got a small woodland patch here, a small woodland patch here, small woodland patch here and then this larger woodland patch here. The second phenomena was habitat fragmentation. So in this in the image this is demonstrated by the woodland areas not being joined and, and being quite small and so populations may either become isolated or have to travel long distances to find food, increasing costs to their survival. This could be due to increased energy expenditure or they may be vulnerable to predators such as birds of prey while in open areas. The third ph phenomena mentioned was habitat deterioration within the patches. So this refers to the quality of the plants and animal prey available within the patches, which may no longer be suitable food for certain species of animals. I'll come on to this later. The final ph phenomena is deterioration of the habitat matrix. So this is linked to fragmentation and isolation of populations, but basically refers to there not being a link between two suitable habitats due to the area between the suitable habitats. So what is the significance uh, for birds of the habitat type they are found in? Well, the type of habitat can have a positive or negative effect on reproductive performance, which basically measures how successful a pair of birds are in raising their offspring. A good quality habitat, for example, will produce good quality nestlings because the parent birds are able to find the food that is needed to raise their offspring. Reproductive performance of birds is usually assessed by measuring a number of variables, which I'll run through now. So the first, me uh, the first measure mentioned in this slide is clutch size. So that's basically how many eggs a bird lays. In the case of blue tits, it can vary from around uh, 8 eggs to, around to, to 14 eggs. Um, in great tits, you find that's about 5 to 12 eggs, so they have a smaller clutch size. Um, we also measure the date that the eggs are laid and you often find that an earlier bird lays, lays in the breeding season the better chances its offspring will have of surviving. So chick mass is another measure taken. Um, each nestling from a nest is weighed and in the case of uh, the botanic garden birds it's when they're 11 days old. Uh, for the purposes of analysis an average of the weight of each individual in a brood or nest is made. So average weight of a nestling per brood is a good measure of future survival um, with nestlings that have low weight being less likely to survive. So even if a chick fledges from the nest, if they fledge with a low weight, their chances of survival are low. So another measure is brood biomass, uh, which is all of the individual weights of each nestling in a brood or nest added together. Uh, then we have uh, another um, parameter which is number fledging and this is a measure of how many offspring leave the nest. This is measured by checking the nests after the breeding season to see if any nestlings didn't make it. Uh, it's basically a little morbid looking for dead bodies in the nest I'm afraid. So habitat quality can be measured by a number of factors and the details I've shown in the brackets under these factors uh, would be an example of a high quality habitat for blue tits and great tits. So an, opto an optimal habitat for these species um, would have a vegetation structure and a characteristic of mature oak canopy, so where they can find plenty of caterpillar food. Um, this also indicates high invertebrate availability. 
So I'm going to talk a bit about why fragmentation is so bad. Um, firstly, it's been found that birds in fragmented habitats have low breeding success due to um, low invertebrate prey being available. So exa examples here of research with Burke and Knoll, and who they looked at density and pairing of oven birds in Ontario in 31 forest fragments. So here you can see a, a picture of an oven bird. Uh, they showed that the males chose their territories uh, depending on the prey biomass, so the total weight of insect food, which and they found that the higher the better. Prey bio biomass was 10 to 36 times higher in large woods and lack of potential nest sites combined with low food abundances in the smaller woods meant that female oven birds found these sites unsuitable for breeding in. And then I, we have move on to some more work, some more research work by um, some scientists called Tremblay and colleagues, and they compared breeding success of blue tits between a mainly deciduous oak woodland and an evergreen home oak woodland in Corsica, France. So evergreen oaks don't have the peak abundance of caterpillars needed for the nestlings during their rearing, and so they represent a poorer habitat than the deciduous oaks, which have a peak of caterpillars. Both blue tits and great tits attempt to coincide the time that um, the nestlings need feeding with this peak abundance in deciduous oak. So the peak is often 10 times higher than in the evergreen. The researchers, they manipulated brood size and showed that in the deciduous habitat, which had an abundance of caterpillars, uh, the birds could successfully raise a brood with three extra nestlings added with no effect on the on the chick weights. But um, when they did this in the evergreen habitat, chick weight and fledging success was shown to be significantly worse with the addition of, a, of extra chicks. And this was due to low abundances of caterpillars. So there was simply not enough food to feed the chicks. In fact, even without the brood manipulation, clutch sizes were lower in, in the evergreen habitat, as were mean masses and they fledged 11% uh, less nestlings than they did in the, the deciduous oak woodland. So we then go on to a study by Hinsley and colleagues, and, and they measured daily energy expenditure of great tits in parks and woodland. So the researchers measured the percentage of gaps in the canopy in both habitats by using a remote sensing technique um, called LIDAR, and this was in the woodland and in the urban parkland. They found that great tits worked 64% harder to feed their chicks in the urban habitat, where there were more gaps. The birds had also uh, raised fewer young, and their nestlings had smaller body weights than in the woodland. So basically these birds were working harder for less return, and their parents, by working much harder, may additionally be putting their survival in jeopardy. So I'm now going to talk about habitat deterioration within patches, another one of SEER and colleagues' four phenomena, specifically in relation to urban parks and gardens. So as I've mentioned before, the increasingly populated modern landscapes of the UK and Europe, and most of the rest of the world, uh, means that many birds and other animals are often found breeding in urban habitats, um, where habitat patches are often small. I've just talked about the problem of birds having to cross physical, structural gaps in order to forage for food and show that they work harder for less. But urban environments have the added problem of often containing an abundant mix of exotic vegetation, which is usually not suitable foraging substrate. So this is known as, as functional gaps. So the vegetation may exist, but it doesn't offer the prey that is needed in order to feed the offspring of a pair of birds. So I have mentioned already, but blue tits and great tits, they're adapted to oak woodland uh, due to the peak of caterpillars that feed on the oak leaves during the breeding season. And that means that their insect prey, they're also adapted to their food. So for insects, the reason exotic plants have lower abundances of insects on them is in part due to the fact that the insects themselves are adapted to the native plants. And they often have specific preferences for the species of plant that they feed on. 
So additionally, plants that are sold for residential gardens are often unpalatable to insects. So these would also be favoured by uh, people as they don't really want their garden plants being eaten by, by lots of insects. Researchers uh, Southwood and colleagues way back in the 1980s showed that non-native plants have lower abundances of insects on them due to insect ad adaptation to native plants and the unpalatability of non-natives. Exotic plants may also flower at different times to the native plants and this means that the timing of the insects that are on these exotics may not match the timing of the nestling feeding period. So urbanisation is therefore likely to, to directly affect insects and spider numbers. So now on to this study. Um, and this study compared breeding success in blue tits and great tits across habitats of differing quality. Um, although these birds are classified as least concern on the IUCN red list, Assessing how their reproductive behaviour differs in different habitats can offer insights into how to manage more vulnerable bird species. So it's also important to keep track of the, the so-called more common birds uh, to monitor any population changes as well. So this study compared um, four different habitat types. So they were large and small wood, and the data was provided by Shelley Hinsley from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. So um, her large woods were Brampton, and there were 22 boxes there, and Wennington Woods, uh, which was 36 boxes. And then there were a number of small woods, um, and there's approximately 36 small woods, up to 1.39 hectares in size, with a total of 56 boxes in Cambridgeshire and Lincolnshire. And we have Wick and Fen, and there were 55 boxes in the National Trust, um, boxes owned by the Bird Ringing Group. Then we have Cow Lane and there were 60 boxes baited in an old gravel pit site and this data was provided by Dr Nancy Harrison from ARU. So both sites, the Wickham Fen and the Cow Lane, contain a mixture of reed bed grassland and willows and a kind of marginal scrubby habitats with structural gaps uh, but with an abundance of native flora in them. And then we come on to the, the Botanic Gardens and this is a large urban landscape garden owned by Cambridge University. Uh, it contains over 10,000 labelled plant species and it has an abundance of exotic plants which is nearly double the amount of the native flora. So I'm just going to talk a bit more about uh, the habitat of Cambridge University Botanic Garden. Um, and the image on there is of the of the botanic gardens. It's an aerial photo, and the red dots that you can see, and with the right writing, indicate where the nest boxes are within the site. So there are around 42 nest boxes in total, although we have had a few uh, attrition over the years. Um, the botanic garden has a high plant species diversity, so it has over 8,000 species of plant including an abundance of exotic flora and it has a varied structure of trees and shrubs interspersed with these kind of open lawns and herbaceous areas. So you have some areas of, of tree canopy, canopy and then you have these other areas of sort of open grass um, gaps, structural gaps within the site. So, to measure breeding perform performance of the birds at uh, the different sites, nest boxes are inspected from around the 1st of April. Uh, we look for signs that the nests are being built, and once built the female will start laying eggs. Um, we make a note of when the first egg is laid, and assume that she lays one egg a day until she's finished her whole clutch. So, for example, if you come across a nest with three eggs, you would work backwards to calculate that the first egg was laid two days previously. So blue tit and great tit eggs look very similar, but are slightly different sizes. I'm not sure how easily you can tell from this picture. Um, the picture shows a mixed clutch of eggs. So basically a blue tit was in the nest first, and a great tit muscled her way in and laid her own clutch over the top. And uh, kind of threw the blue tit out. But great tit eggs are a bit larger than blue tits. 
So the blue tit eggs in this picture are on the bottom underneath the, the great tit eggs um, that are much larger on the top of the clutch here. So clutch size is, is then recorded and a reminder that clutch size refers to the total number of eggs that an individual lays in one breeding attempt. The female usually begins incubating her eggs when she lays the final or final but one egg of a clutch. Although they have been known to de delay incubation if there's a cold or a wet snap. We don't really handle the birds during incubation or egg laying to minimise the stress. So if the female bird is found to be incubating when we need to check the clutch, we would simply replace the lid and just wait for her to leave. Often the male comes along with food to feed her and he'll, he'll usually call her out. So if you sit and watch somewhere hidden away, you can just wait till the female leaves. Um, hatching date is estimated as, as 14 days after the female has laid the last egg um, but the nests are usually checked about two days prior to this to ensure accurate dates. We then know exactly when the nestlings have hatched and so we can determine their age and when they need to be ringed and weighed. So this takes place when they're 11 days old. So when the nestlings are 11 days old, um, we count the number in a brood. So that's the total number of birds in one nest. And we place a uniquely numbered uh, British Trust for Ornithology ring on each nestling's leg, allowing it to be identified if it's later caught. You can just about make out the rings on the yellow and blue string in the top right hand picture. Uh, that's me taking, taking a ring off, off the string of rings. The rings are very lightweight aluminium weighing. I think they weigh around 0.3% of a bird's weight. Um, very small chicks known as runts are not ringed if their legs are deemed too small for the ring. And each chick in a brood is weighed and the mean mass and the biomass, so that's the total of all chick weights in a brood, is later calculated. So no visits are made to the nest after the 11th day until after the chicks should have fledged. So this is usually around 19 to 20 days after hatching. This also avoids the risk of the nestlings leaving the, the nest prematurely. Sometimes they will what's called explode from a nest if disturbed at the later stages of development. Um, so they just kind of disperse very quickly from the nest and, and sort of hop around under the bushes. Um, this is possibly a, a predator defence mechanism. The nests are visited after this time and then the number of fledged is determined by counting any remains, um, including rings, and subtracting this from the total nestlings that were ringed on, on day 11. And so to the results, um, I applied a series of different statistical modelling on the data that we collected to analyse the breeding success of blue tits and great tits in the, the botanic gardens compared to the other habitat types. Um, so the woodland, fen and scrubby marginal habitat. I won't go into the details of the statistics, uh, but I have produced a table that compares the reproductive success of the botanic gardens to the other, the other habitats. Um, so basically the models compare the different reproductive parameters, so we've got them up here, so we've got egg date, uh, clutch size, mean chick mass, we've got chick biomass and we've got fledging success, so that's the percentage of eggs um, that, that made it to fledge. And then we've also got the species over here, so we've got blue tit and we've got great tit and these are the different sites, we've got cow lane, wick and fen, small woods, brampton wood and wennington wood. And then we've got them all compared um, to the Botanic Gardens, which is up here. Um, so for egg date, um, and a reminder that the birds that lay earlier often do better, having larger clutches and higher quality offspring. It's also been argued that early laying is an indication of better quality habitat. So the blue tits and great tits differ in their laying in the Botanic Gardens. So great tits actually laid earlier in the garden than at all sites but the blue tits mainly laid later in the garden. Um, so early laying in urban environments has been found for other species of birds um, but it's not really clear why. 
or why blue tits and great tits differ in this study. So some possibilities uh, include the warmer weather in urban environments and this might um, cause earlier bud bursts of plants and hence earlier caterpillars um, available. And also feeding from bird feeders may allow So I have a couple of graphs here that show the relationship between first egg date and chick biomass of the blue tits and great tits in the different habitats. Um, so on this side we've got the blue tits and on this side we've got the great tits. And just a reminder that biomass is the total weight of all nestlings from a brood. So on these graphs biomass in grams is shown on the y-axis here. And then we've got first egg date on the x-axis, with zero being the 1st of April. Um, the circles represent the different sites that were studied. So we've got blue for Botanic Gardens, green for Wigan Fen, red for Cow Lane, uh, purple for Brampton Wood and black for all small woods. Um, as you can see, the botanic garden has the lowest chick biomass in both species and large woods um, have more or less the highest biomass. So we've got the blue down here and then um, we've got the, the sort of purple colour up here indicating the higher brood biomass. Uh, at all sites, early laying leads to more offspring with a greater biomass, indicating more and probably heavier, heavier nestlings. However, at the Botanic Garden and at Wickham Fen, there is quite a scatter on this graph, so the pattern is not, is not really that clear. So we have a real clear downward um, slope here, whereas it, it, here they're, they're more scattered about um, so this may be indicative of the woodland sites having the caterpillar peak, uh, whereas the Wick and Fen site and the Botanic Gardens don't have the oak peaks. So laying early at these sites may not have quite the same advice. And then we've got this graph which shows the relationship between clutch size and mean biomass. And this time we have clutch size as the x-axis down here and we have mean biomass as the y-axis. And as expected for all sites, if they, they lay more eggs, in most cases result in a greater biomass. So you can see that this slope goes upwards like this. However, in the botanic garden for both blue tits and great tits, when the clutches were large, so we've got a large clutch here of 10 for great tits and we've got a large clutch here of 12 for blue tits, um, biomass dropped sharply. And this indicates an inability to raise a large brood in the botanic garden, so with a large number of chicks perishing. The parents simply don't have enough available food to, lead, uh, to feed a large brood. So you have it dropping off down here. So on this graph, uh, you see the relationship between clutch size and mean weight per brood. So you have again clutch size here on the x-axis and the mean weight along here on the y-axis. Um, and this graph shows that at most sites other than the botanic garden, the average weight of an individual nestling stays relatively constant. So these are kind of in more of a horizontal line. They're staying round about, I guess, what's that, 16 grams for a, a small woodland. However, at the, at the gardens, large clutches, so uh, you've got 10 eggs or more here, were associated with reduced mean masses and you've got as low as sort of 11 grams here for um, for great tits um, when they should really be around 18 grams if they're in a good a quality habitat like a woodland. So this effect was, is less pronounced for blue tits here. See it's kind of more pronounced for great tits over here. Um, which may suggest that the habitat in the botanic gardens may have a greater negative effect on great tits. So basically great tits can feed their brood better when it's smaller and if they have large clutches they simply can't feed all their nestlings. Uh, this also supports the brood manipulation study that we um, had that I talked about by Tremblay earlier. 
So in poor habitats, nestlings either suffer with a reduction in their mean mass or they just don't survive at all. And this also supports the hypothesis that exotic um, flora is sort of food poor habitat for nestlings. So blue tits may be more successful than great tits at raising a brood in the botanic gardens uh, with their nestlings being a more consistent weight. Uh, if you see from these pictures it shows um, two great tits at both at the same age so they're both 11 days old. Uh, the small one here shows a great tit at the botanic gardens and the larger great tit here is um, one from Wickham Fen. And as I said previously, mean mass of, of chicks is a good indicator of future survival, with those with greater weights being more likely to survive. Therefore, although this chick at the, the botanic garden here has survived up until 11 days old, it's unlikely to survive to full adulthood. But fledging success of both species um, is similar at the botanic gardens and that's around 50%. So you've got this bar chart um, compares blue tit and great tit fledging success at the botanic garden. Um, the, blue, the blue bar here is being blue tits and the red bar here is being great tits. Um, and then you've got on the Y axis the percentage of eggs that made it to fledging. Um, so whether blue tits fledge with better weights than great tits is still a bit speculative at the moment um, and I'm currently working on some, some more analyses to test this. Um, the error bars on the chart also shows that, that fledging success, we've got the error bars here, fledging success is, is highly variable and it ranges from kind of 20 to 90 percent within the, within the botanic gardens. So what do all these findings mean? Um, well basically blue tits and great tits at the botanic gardens had poorer reproductive success when compared to the marginal habitat of Wigan Fen and to a lesser extent the cow lane and, and small woods. So they had lower clutches, they had lighter chicks, um, lower broods and lower fledging success than at Wigan Fen. So structurally, Wick and Fen and the Botanic Gardens are similar. So they have shrub layers kind of interspersed with trees. And so the main difference between the two species appears to be in the, in the plant composition. So you've got more native plants at Wick and Fen versus the uh, Botanic Gardens, which has uh, much more exotic plants. Um, and this could point to the, towards the idea that the functional gaps um, where you've got trees there, but they're just not appropriate foraging substrates, as well as structural gaps, so where these are physical gaps within the canopy, exacerbate the poor reproductive success in the botanic gardens. So reproductive success overall was poor at the botanic gardens in comparison to, to most of the sites, um, especially Wick and Fen, and the wood and large woodlands and to a lesser extent poorer than at uh, cow lane and small woods. So despite both species of blue tits and great tits reducing their clutch sizes in comparison to the other sites, um, the clutch sizes at the botanic gardens still seem to be maladaptive um, as indicated by significantly lower brood biomasses. Um, so by maladaptive I mean an animal is not able to change adequately to fit the environmental conditions. Um, in this case, although blue tits and great tits at the botanic gardens do lay fewer eggs uh, than they do at the other habitats, they can actually do with laying even less to enable them to feed all of their nestlings and get them all to a good weight. Um, so, say so, both species are unable to raise large broods with chicks with healthy masses, and they had high chick mortality, and that's indicated by sort of low biomasses for large clutches when they did try. So blue tits may perform slightly better than great tits at the botanic gardens um, with the nestlings having greater um, mean masses and maybe a greater likelihood of survival and recruitment but this is still um, 
tentative and speculative at the moment and sit need to warrant um, further investigations because both species still perform poorly compared to other sites and also fledging success in both species is similar. But overall, the poor performance at the Botanic Gardens indicates a food-poor habitat in, habitat as acerbated by the inappropriate foraging substrate, so you've got the exotic flora that might not house the, the insect prey that they need. And this study suggests that, that parks and gardens could be improved by increasing the proportion of, of native plant species, and particularly native deciduous plant trees um, within them. So some of my thoughts and future work. Yeah, it's been argued that maladaptation, like the clutch sizes in the botanic gardens, means that although um, clutch sizes are reduced, they're still not small enough. And uh, it's been argued that this happens due to populations not being genetically isolated. So in other words, the population in the botanic gardens is unable, unable to evolve much smaller clutch sizes due to the continual influx of birds from different habitats. So these habitats are known as sink populations. These are populations that can only be sustained from immigration from better quality habit, habitats known as source habitats, such as deciduous woodland. However, whether or not the botanic gardens and urban habitats in general are sink populations is, is quite a complex issue and really requires further study. Urban habitats may, for example, be better for overwinter survival. Um, cities are often a few degrees warmer than rural locations and food is often put out for birds in the winter, which could aid their survival. So also the continual presence of humans during the day may limit opportunities for predation. And if birds can survive longer in urban environments and therefore spread their reproduction over a longer period than their woodland counterparts, then although they have a smaller number of chicks fledged per year, overall, if they live longer than woodland birds, they may actually have a similar number of offspring over their whole life uh, compared to woodland birds. Now, just a, a short last note about extremes of weather. Um, we had a paper out back in 2012 when there was a very wet breeding season. Uh, the paper compared breeding success in the botanic garden um, and woodland and showed that the garden birds performed better than their woodland counterparts in that particular year. So being constrained by the peak of caterpillars in woodland and the caterpillars um, being washed off the leaves or not even emerging meant that they had little food to feed their nestlings. In the gardens, the birds, the birds feed on a variety of invertebrates other than caterpillars, um, such as spiders, um, and are not so reliant on the peak caterpillar. They could therefore spread their breeding out over a longer period um, and feed on other prey when the weather improved. So our research on, on blue tits and great tits shows that although reproductive success is usually reduced compared to woodland, using comparative data, for 10 years demonstrated how the performance in different habitats can be modified by extreme weather. So given the likelihood of an increase in extreme climate events such as intense rainfall, perhaps our urban birds will triumph after all. I just want to thank you for, for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.